And welcome to the Rob Call Bottom Up Show. It's available on Pacifica Radio Network and Progressive Radio Network and iTunes and Stitcher and on YouTube on the Bottom Up Channel, Bottom Up Show Channel. And it's also available at opednews.com slash podcasts where the complete archives of the show are over 450 shows over the years. My guest for this show is Ed Frauenheim. He's Senior Director of Content at Great Place to Work, the research organization behind the Fortune 100 Best Companies to Work For list. And he's co-author of the book, Reinventing Masculinity, The Liberating Power of Compassion and Connection. He's also doing workshops on more successful, inclusive masculinity at work. He's co-presenting them. And the website is reinventingmasculinity.com. So great to have you on the show. Thanks. Great to be here, Rob. Yeah, it was fun because yeah, I, I think, you know, I, I, I talk about a lot of stuff from a bottom up perspective, but a lot of what you're saying in your book really agrees with a lot of stuff that I've, I've said in my book, Bottom Up Revolution. So that was fun. And it's but you're really focusing on an area that is, is so important. I mean, you know, you, you mentioned the different kinds of masculinity. There's confined masculinity and liberating masculinity. And, mm -hmm. and, and you only mentioned once in the book, the idea of toxic masculinity. But I think that that's something pretty important to, to, to kind of address. I mean, so, so what's the problem? And, and what's the solution in, in a nutshell to start off with? And then we'll get into more details, okay? Sure, thanks, Rob. Um, and just one quick clarification, I recently left Great Place to Work uh, after after seven years there. So now I'm working independently, but still have a great relationship with them. I just wanted to clarify um, on, my, on my own now. Uh, and um, I would say that uh, in a nutshell, the problem is that the, the conventional way of being a man, uh, of showing up as a man and, uh, with these traits, like a very few set number of roles we can identify as, like a provider, protector, or conqueror, and with limited ways of relating to others, like through competition, through dominance, with a stoic, non-emotional approach, uh, and, and being very self-sufficient uh, to the point of isolation. These are outdated, dangerous, uh, and unhealthy uh, ways of showing up as a man in the 21st century. Uh, and what we believe is, is, the, is that solution uh, in a nutshell, is what we call a liberating masculinity. It builds on and expands uh, on, on the, the foundation of what's been that confined masculinity to say men can have more roles uh, that, that, that are given more options, such as caregiver, uh, sensitive lover, environmental steward, as well as to relate to others in new ways uh, or more ways, uh, like collaborating, not just competing, uh, being emotionally intelligent and available, uh, seeing ourselves as interconnected and interdependent with others. Uh, and we believe this is a masculinity that, that frees men and all those around them to live fuller uh, and more inclusive lives. Okay. But you know, some women want the confined masculinity guys. They want the bad boys. So yeah. who are they and why? Well, it's a great question. Um, well, this idea of confined masculinity has been super powerful in our culture uh, going back even to agricultural days uh we we argue it's similar to what you said in your book rob uh and that masculinity is is kind of an ethos right it's uh men and women by have bought into it uh it's been more dangerous and more more uh more of a problem for women uh we believe but but both uh you know get gain something from it woman maybe um, comfortable with or happy with this idea of being protected and, and provided for. And those are, you know, positive quite traits in a way. We don't want to get rid of those ones, but we're saying that when men can see themselves as more fully human, uh, when they can adopt what some, some characteristics that have in the past been called feminine, uh, but really are, are all part of our birthright uh, as human beings, uh, such as compassion and connection, we're all better off. It, it, it reminds me, I've done a couple of interviews with people who are experts on uh, religious extremism. And there are aspects of a number of different uh, Christian faiths, and not only Christian faiths, but also Orthodox Jews and some Muslims, where women have a very 
a specific place in the, in the world, in the kitchen, with your, at home, in bed. Uh, you know, just in the last week, a guy lost his job because he was telling women that what they needed to do was make themselves look attractive for their men. Uh, so part of this is not just the ethos or the culture, but it's it's in the religions. Yeah. How do you, you know that's it's it's deeply embedded in in, in how we've existed as, as human beings for a long time, uh, but there but even within some of those religions, there's always been countervailing um, forces, I would say, Rob, and and some of those are getting stronger as you see more and more women uh, pastors. Uh, you know, the many religions are are experiencing trouble with with their. Con more conventional approaches and, and, and people are finding that they're seeking spirituality outside of those strictures um, where there is greater, greater freedom and an individual opportunity. So I, I think, um, you know, I, I know I, I go to a church in San Francisco, a Presbyterian church led by a female pastor. Uh, and, and a lot of the men in, the, in that church actually are, are gay men. Uh, and so it has a very uh, welcoming feel in terms of this masculinity that we're describing, this more liberating masculinity where men are, are doing a lot of the caregiving work, take, caring for the for the for the sick, caring for those who are suffering and sad. Uh, and this is not to say men haven't always had compassion, but it hasn't been something that's been as much of a sanctioned uh, behavior uh, in, in the past. No, I, I, on au contraire, I mean, being compassionate, being nice, being sensitive, those are often Men, are, men who do those things are tr treated as though they're effeminate. Yeah. Yes, that's that's true for sure. Yeah. So let's oh. get a little bit more detail into to each of the two kinds: the confined masculinity and the, the liberating masculinity. Uh, I'll just read off a couple of, of things that I picked up from the book. Confined masculinity is dominant, competing, winning, no compassion or caring. I, I read it as being more narcissistic. It's got truncated imagination, myopic, myopic perspective, embrace of hyper-individualism, pecking orders and physical aggression. They treat everyone as a competitor, see themselves as superior. Uh, they feel to notice emotional cues, like, the, like the, they see themselves as, as superior and treating everybody as a competitor. To me, I've done a lot of, of, of interviews and writing about narcissism and psychopathy. That just rings of narcissism. It's almost like this the, the ma this competitor version of masculinity, the dominant one in Western culture and Eastern culture as well. Almost all cultures, you know, there are a few um, female-led cultures, um, mm -hmm. but not many. You know, I've had some great conversations with Brianna Eisler about that, how mm. that used to be, but it's, yeah. it's not anymore. And it, it, but those, they seem like they're rooted in narcissism. And, you know, I've, it, it, it really got me thinking, you know, I've tried to figure out where did all the narcissism come from? And, you know, I, I definitely go back to the onset of civilization. It, it kind of unleashed it, you know, Trump's mm -hmm. presidency really unleashed it. But yeah. now, you got me thinking about how this is this is just a part of being a man is being a narcissist yuck <laughs> well i would say it's it's not an it's not inherent in being a man it's more it's the way we've been acculturated to yeah. your point I, I think uh i think you i think it's a good framing that when you take this sum up this confined masculinity it is lends itself to narcissism uh, it's very much about separateness from others uh which leads to kind of that self-absorbedness uh, that narcissism, uh, and at the same time, as you pointed out, we, you know, for for the vast majority of human existence, we were much more egalitarian. Men and women were egalitarian, coming from a place of of autonomy where we gave each other the freedom to do what we wanted to do, didn't try to boss each other around, uh, and we had a sense of gratitude and abundance. So that now, men were that also. To be clear, we were talking before we got on the air about before civilization. Yeah, in the, the forager, hunter-gatherer period. Exactly. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. and and that is the way humans existed for ninety-nine percent of their time on Earth, too. Yeah. So this yeah, I, I we I we're we're super pleased to have a, a forward in our our book from a, a compassion scholar, Paul Gilbert, 
and he kind of turned uh, us onto that that history or that prehistory, really. Uh, and it's it's super important, I think, for men to realize there isn't isn't just one way to be a man. And that is, in some ways, when we say reinvent, it's sort of say let's pull back these pieces that have been around for for a long time and put one together that's really suited for the 21st century that we think is 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 uh, you know leads to a, a greater moral life, uh, but also it gives us more power. You know, we talk about the liberating power of compassion and connection it allows us to do more in our lives, in our work lives, but also have fuller, better relationships at home uh, and in, in, in society. And, and just to kind of, and that's what you experience by living with liberating masculinity. Now, I, I want to wrap up one little more thing with the confined masculinity. You, you, you also talk about how men, they either try to be dominating or if they can't, then they seek domination. And that's, yeah. that's an authoritarian personality. Yeah, it, it is a, a disturbing trend. We saw January 6th, right? And, and in, in the wake and lead up to it, that folks are drawn, many men are, especially in this period, I think of gender confusion, Rob, where, where there's a lot of uh, younger folks, especially are, are saying, I don't want to even define myself in terms of a, of a gender, being male or female, being non-binary. Uh, when, when women are, are playing more and more roles in, 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 in breadwinning roles or in the economy. Uh, some men are kind of reverting back to this sense of, I, I just want a clear, simple truth. And, and I, my own sense of masculinity is being challenged by all these developments. I'm going to, uh, we know that there's evidence when men's masculinity is, is challenged, they tend to overreact or overcompensate. And so even becoming even more uh, dominant or seeking someone who's, who, who, ha who has that persona as Trump did, uh, you know, even calling for people to be beat up at his campaign rallies or celebrating when that bus was run off the road in a very dangerous incident. So yes, that is one of the problems. So that's a connection. That's a, a limited connection. You know, we're calling, when we talk about connection, it's more, I think what you're talking about with this co connection consciousness that it, we're really all together. This is planet, you know, spaceship Earth, as Buckminster Fuller put it. Uh, we have to see ourselves in the same boat, and you know, we're all trying to figure out how to make life on Earth positive and generative, and and avoid these catastrophic challenges that are that are really coming down the pike to us. Yeah, and what what I say in the book is that bottom up consciousness, as as opposed to top down consciousness, bottom up consciousness is about is connection consciousness. It's connection and awareness that we're connected to everybody and everything, to nature, to yeah. our our, you know, and it's just like Native Americans. They have this idea of making decisions based on how they'll affect the next seven generations, mm -hmm. and, and this confined masculinity. It, it's like, what's in it for me? Yeah, yeah, maybe I think that's a good way to put it. Right, you and the team, maybe your own family. It's the, it's my castle. Uh, it, it's my my fiefdom, um, and uh, very it, it doesn't extend far. That sense of of who I'm, my circle of care, is a phrase we've used. And and my my co-author Ed Adam saw this in a lot in in the patients he's worked as a, as a psychologist. He's uh, had a practice, and he also started a men's group. Um, 30 years worth of this group called Men Mentoring Men, and has just found that that very limited viewpoint uh, and that sense of being a provider and a protector, while that's in some ways noble, it really led to a pretty impoverished life where men were feeling pretty empty by middle age. And, and there's often a calling to seek something more. You know, I think that can be warped, you know, in terms of some of like the Proud Boys movements, but there's something possible that is, is a much more a uh, positive version of that more universal connectedness that, that you're, you're talking about as well, Rob. So what percentage of men do you think are living even partially liberated masculinity? That's a great question. Uh, we don't have any kind of data on that directly. We've asked some of the, the folks that have come to some of our events and webinars what they think, uh, having been familiar, become familiar with the book, and it's a minority. Uh, probably, but you know, exactly how small, I'm not sure, but one good, one promising sign in a way is that 47% of men voted for Joe Biden, uh, 53 voted for Trump, which is, you know, that's the, the glass half empty, but 47% voting for a guy that is in some ways a, a very good representative of, of a liberating masculinity, someone who's willing to be empathetic, emotionally available, 
um, willing to, to admit mistakes. That's one of the, I think the, the chief problems with that confined masculinity is that you are so unwilling to be in, to be vulnerable that you can't learn. You can't acknowledge you made uh, an error so that you can learn from it. Biden says that crime bill of the nineties was a mistake and he's been trying to fix it ever since. So the fact that so many men backed him, uh, you know, that's not maybe the only reason they backed him, but uh, that to me is, is a hopeful sign. You know, y yesterday Biden and Harris, uh, promoted two women to very high ranking general status in the military. Mm. And they both gave talks about the role of women. And I, I just sat there flabbergasted because I think, you know, you expect it from Harris, but it was great coming from a vice president. But then Biden went on mm. repeatedly, repeatedly saying that women can do anything. And that you know, women are now have access to every part of the military, and, and but on the other hand, I wonder how does that threaten these confined men too? I mean, that's part of the problem is they is is they are feeling threatened. You know, you yeah. you you you've written about how the January sixth and the attack on the Capitol there was a connection with that. Yeah, I, I think it's 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 that sense of of. Uh, who you are as a man, as as being the one who's supposed to be that that strong protector figure. Well, if, if you're not having to protect women anymore, that throws your identity into into jeopardy or into question. Um, and uh, there's a call, almost like a refusal to grow up and to mature into this masculinity that's called for by our times, uh, as we see it. Uh, to kind of you know, even that the term proud boys is telling to me, Rob, that it's like boys. It's it's like almost like the Peter Pan lost boys. Like they're not really sure how to fit in. So they're going to gear up and, and have big guns uh, and threaten people. Um, and that's, you know, I think a, a sign of not sort of moving forward to, a you know, a, the ability to be integrating both the, the sort of old positives of noble, you know, some of the noble ways that men in the past operated. Uh, and, and then some of these characteristics, these soft skills of the 21st century, like listening, empathy, uh, creating a, a psychological safety on your teams at work. We need these things to, to, to advance and to really be, bring out our full human potential. Now, that's the first, uh, you're, you're mentioning soft skills. It's the first time I heard that concept. Now, I've, I've written about and I've done interviews uh, with the guy who wrote the book on soft power. And there's soft power and there's hard power. Hard power is guns and money and force. Soft power is persuasion and attraction. So soft skills, what are the hard skills? Hard skills uh, in, in the business realm would be things like uh, knowing how to code with this particular language, like Python, or, or knowing how to um, conduct a, uh, uh, um, a, uh, an anal a spreadsheet analysis, a financial analysis a of a business plan, maybe some statistical uh, skills, high level math stuff. Soft skills are things like communication, the ability to be, uh, to demonstrate empathy, uh, the ability to read the vibe of a room even. Um, and, and these are things that historically, a lot of male leaders didn't worry about. They didn't, they didn't need to necessarily get in front of a crowd or communicate they might have just wrote, typed a memo or told their their executive team to, to spread the, the news or the orders down through the, the chain of command. Uh, they often were, okay, it was okay for them to go into angry outbursts, you know, like the Lou Grant figure from Mary Tyler Moore, just like barking at orders. Um, or uh, to really be a, to, oblivious to privilege and power and how we might show up and, and who might be feeling less uh uh, able to speak and have a voice in some of these uh, business settings. These are the skills that are increasingly important in what we call a faster, flatter, fairness-focused work world. So, skills. So, we need to take a break now. When we come back, I want to talk about how the value of soft skills, because I really believe sure. that they drastically increase the value of leaders, of politicians, and it, 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 they enhance their power. So we're gonna take a 30 second break so I can pop the bumpers into the show and then we'll continue, okay? Great. Okay. 
My guest for the show is Ed Frauenheim. He was the senior director of content at Great Place to Work, the research organization behind the Fortune 100 Best Companies to Work for List until very recently. And he's doing workshops on more successful, inclusive masculinity at work. And he's the author of the new book, Reinventing Masculinity, the, the Liberating Power of Compassion and Connection. So soft skills, I really think that and, and I think of soft skills as bottom-up skills too. I, I think mm -hmm. that that if somebody comes off or a company comes off as having those kinds of skills, manifests those skills, uses them in dealing with people, whether or a politician dealing with constituents, I think it gives them more power. I think it as a soft skill, like a soft power, it, it attracts. And, and the value that, of that, that I think that's is, the key is incredible. And it because, you know, I, I've, I've been coaching politicians for a number of years on, on how to give stump speeches. And usually they got five minutes and they want to talk about who they are, their stories, if they're smart and, and, and their issues. Sometimes they'll just talk about their issues, which I think is totally blowing the connection opportunity. You I agree. Need, you need to draft these ideas into stories. And yes. I, I believe that because it's the stories that connect people at the heart level. And, and I think it's the same thing with all these soft skills you're talking about. So, but you're doing it. You're, yeah. you're, you're in, in the, work, the business world. How do, how do people use this? How do they? They're, I think they're it? using it in much the same way you described with the politicians, Rob. Like the, the importance of leaders being vulnerable and telling their stories, including their uh, their weaknesses or their moments of, of uh, poignant uh, revelation. Uh, one example I'll, I'll, I'll share is, is the head of Cisco, the technology giant, 80,000 employees roughly around the world. And their CEO is Chuck Robbins. We mentioned him in the book. He uh, had a dream of visiting one of the homeless enc encamp encampments near uh, San Jose's headquarters, the Cisco headquarters in San Jose, California. And in that dream, he saw the face of his pastor and his uh, father. And the next morning he woke up and said, I've got to get involved in this problem. Uh, and then he shared this, this interest in, in solving the homelessness problem, shared that story publicly with us, a great place to work. Uh, and it helped catalyze the whole company to be more active as, as a charitable organization, to be more philanthropic. And it was not at the cost of business success. In fact, they launched the most successful uh, networking gear product during his his time and the stock price reached a new high in 20 years. This is all because he people were dr drawn to him, as you put it, Rob, that he's opening his heart and people are flooding in essentially to say, yes, I'm with you. I want to work for an inspiring leader like you, not necessarily this general who's cold and just marching us around. Uh, it's that leader who really cares and wants to, to make a better world. Uh, and, and more generally, there's research on this that Google's got a famous study that the most successful teams were not the teams with the smartest people, the most credentialed people. They're the people, they were the teams that had the most psychological safety, where people could feel safe to reveal themselves and not to be mocked, but rather to bring their whole selves. So if you've got a, a male leader that's in, in, uh, oblivious to emotions, to not, not noticing that someone is really withdrawn or hurt or hurting, not willing to share their own pain, a little bit or, or the challenges they might be wrestling with, you're not going to create that psychological safety. You're not going to be as effective. So to your point, soft skills are success skills these days, and they, they create a lot of power in the work world. And I think they're also power skills. You know, one of the issues I think in letting go mm -hmm. of this confined idea of masculinity is giving up power, but really mm -hmm. you're, you're cutting your power have being a confined masculine guy, you are restricting the kind of power you have access to. And it's all hard power that requires a lot of resources, whether money or, or energy or what have you. And, and when you can let go of it, you can start tapping a different kind of power that is far more powerful. And I think that's a, an interesting way to frame it really. I love that. Yeah, the heart heart power is a term I hadn't I've heard, I haven't heard, but I think you're right on that, Rob. And there, have you heard of the organizational philosophy called Teal? 
it's uh, associated the color teal uh, and teal organizations. No, what it, is it's it? that's why our book cover has got the teal on it. Uh, it, it is a, it's an organizational philosophy that is exactly in line with what this bottom up uh, approach, I, I would argue. It, it is um, the notion that when leaders stop trying to be those top down um, commanders, but rather are about their about the purpose, they're about setting an overall direction and then the, uh, distributing power and letting um, everyone in the organization make decisions. Uh, that's when those those organizations take off. Uh, so there's these teal organizations are defined by autonomy and self-management. They're defined by a sense of holism that treating people and, and the planet as, as a one whole. And they're finally about evol an evolving sense of purpose, much more than profit. And these organizations, they release a, a ton of power. You, you know, you could call it heart power or soul power as people just bring their best to the table and, and are excited to, to work at a place that they can be their full selves and they can have be treated as, as an adult with power. Well, I, you know, I think that Trump, you know, uh, the United States has been known for, for many decades as having an enormous amount of soft power with its music, with its stories, with its mm -hmm. movies, uh, its, its, its actors. And I think Trump did enormous damage by taking on this different masculinity role. And yeah. I, I think it hurt the United States <coughs> and cost it a lot of power, a real yeah. lot of power. But, you know, there's another kind of thinking about power, too, that, that I think fits in with this, and that's there's power over and there's power with. And, yeah. and what, what the liberating masculinity is all about is power with. And the confined yes. masculinity is all about power over. <laughs> And it's even, yeah, well, I, even yeah. in the voice, you know, I hate those ads that come on with a guy with a, with an ultra baritone voice going, yes, we have the product for you because you're a man. Right, right. Well, yeah, I agree with you, Rob. And I think one thing that's interesting about that power over power with is I see a connection to, the, to how predominant competition is in our society. And that is all about who's going to have the power over, who is, who is, the most powerful in this particular contest. And we are thrust into these in ways, it's almost like the water we swim in. And, and I noticed this as a parent when I had two kids, now they're teenagers, but that's almost all that was available for activities for kids. One competition after another, sports. Even if you're gonna do artistic things, there was always the contest of who's better than others in this stuff. Um, and I think one of the, the things that the liberating masculinity makes available is, a, you know, it, it is in some ways a feminine energy or feminine tradition of let's collaborate, you know, let's have a good relationship instead of one where one of us has to best the other. And we're seeing that in, in, in organizations too, where internally, and even sometimes externally, the organizations that are succeeding have a great internally collaborative culture, and often are willing to collaborate with other organizations in, that are nearby, you know, they're making friends as opposed to seeing everybody as, as foes. I, I, I agree with you completely. You know, you talk about a couple different ways that the culture is changing. And mm -hmm. one of the ways is with the media and with stories. You, you mentioned mm -hmm. Sopranos and Breaking Bad and Game of Thrones. Talk about how that's changing things. Yeah, I love I love checking out the way the culture is moving and, and seeing how that has an impact on, our, on us. Uh, you know, I, I, I binged watch uh, Game of Thrones uh, to sort of, you know, I had an excuse to do it for the book as I was writing it. But I just found it to be so interesting that the, uh, the, the dominant male characters ended up being much more of this liberating masculinity um, in that persuasion rather than that confined masculinity, the guy who becomes the new king. And, you know, the, the, and the, the, the confined masculinity characters were the bad guys. Yeah. And they, and they were part of what you saw was that they were not very successful. I mean, it's there's the word fragility gets used now in, in terms of race. It's also kind of fragility around masculinity because you can't thrive in multiple uh, arenas. You're only, you're kind of stuck in one where men are calling the shots and everybody's agreeing with this these hierarchical chains of command. Well, when things become more fluid, there's a more global inter interconnected economy. Things are fast. Uh, you know, there's those organizations that are led by guys like that. They're too slow to respond. They don't, they can't get information 
uh, up to the top and the, the top guy's got to figure stuff out and then send the, the orders back down. By the time that all happens, an opportunity has been lost or a threat has metastasized. So uh, these these ways that are that are operating where you're going to see men, in, you know, in like Game of Thrones and others not succeed is because they, they can't be fluid enough to, to make decisions effectively and, and uh, you know, make ally, create ally ships. And, and, and if they're only transactional, they're not going to have the kind of loyalty or, or uh, the trust that is really vital to success. So, I, and I love that you see it in the Avengers movies too, where it's not just about the, the one super strong guy. It takes everybody's coordinated networking and, and their own gifts, if you will, to bring about, you know, the, the better universe. So I, I think there's a lot of promising storylines underway you know in our culture right now no, i i 100 agree with you i i i was think makes me think of shonda rhimes new yes show bridgerton i just finished watching the first season yeah i love that one yeah and that that breaks so many stereotypes i mean and i think that's what's really needed it it's the writers have to help us with this they i mean shonda the artist, rhimes right? has the power all by herself to just break through people's conception and, and rigid ideas of, of, of what men are. I mean, and she's doing yeah. it. She, she's already been doing it. And, and right. we, need, we need a lot of writers to do that. So if you're a writer, start, don't, don't create these rigid, constricted masculine characters. Yeah. You know, because, you know, really, if you create a character who tends to be, uh, have more liberating masculinity, it's a more complex character too. As that's, a writer. that's so well said. That's really well said. Um, uh, what in, an interesting guy that I think of when you're saying all that, Rob, is um, Justin Baldoni. He was in. He was a star of the show um, Jane the Virgin, uh, kind of a, a funny uh, but poignant show. And he is like you know total buff, ripped, manly dude. And he's got a new. He had a TED talk about how he stopped trying to be man enough. And he's a new a memoir coming out. Uh, I think it's called um, Man Enough, how I learned to undefine my masculinity or something along those lines. And he asked these questions. Are you strong enough to be sensitive? Are you secure enough to listen to the woman in your life? You know, he's, he's pushing this boundary as well. And, you know, you can't accuse him of being a soft dude. He's like, you know, he's like Mr. Weightlifter guy. So uh, you're right. It, these cultural figures can really make a difference. Um, and you see it in the realm of sports too. I don't know if, if that's a realm that you are paying attention to, or you're a sports, on my sports list, fan. That's the, the next question on my. Oh, good. <laughs> I'm a, yeah, I'm a sports guy, and I love, and yet you know, I'm troubled by the amount of competition. But I, what I love is that in the world of competition, it's these guys that are the liberating masculinity adherents that are succeeding. How's They're that? noticing that, like almost what we were saying with the business world, it's only when you bring out the full potential of an entire team now can you win. Because teams have gotten better to the point, where, you know, if they just have a, a superstar or two, but without all that supporting uh, networked uh, performance, that's not good enough. So that's why the Warriors were able to win three championships in, in three in five years in, in the M NBA. They had an offense and a defensive coordination that was astounding. But yes, they had some superstars, but what what really made them stand apart was the level of coordination and communication and trust on that team and you know you've got your c's which we'll get to your five or six d's mm -hmm. i mean and you also talk a lot about interdependence which is not a c but cooperation is mm -hmm. is, is really another really big one and that's the opposite of domination really that's a great point yeah and a great story from that <clears throat> in that in that uh, topic, Rob, is is Steph Curry, the Warrior, Golden State Warriors star point guard. He, uh, you know, he has been MVP of the league. Uh, and then he was, they were trying to invite another uh, great player named Kevin Durant to come to the team. And, and Curry's like, if you come here, I don't care whether you get the MVP or I get the MVP. I just want to, to win with you. And, and we would like, we will share the spotlight. You know, that's the kind of cooperative spirit you had, whereas in the past, it was all, all these debates about who's the man, whose team is this? It's like a possessive, dominant approach. That's not what the Warriors said. In fact, their team values were um, compa included compassion. It was compassion, mindfulness, competition, and joy was the last one, I believe. 
uh, if I remember, remember, memory serves. And that is just such a different philosophy than like the 80s or 90s teams when they're all about bashing the other team. You know, this is about, you know, sort of incredible levels of cooperation and trust. And ultimately, like just, you know, joy is their weapon is the way one sports writer described the Warriors. That's how much fun they're having on the court as they're playing this beautiful game of, of pass work and, and uh, coordination, really, you could put it that way. You know, I'm not into sports. I'm not a spectator sports guy. I, okay. For my sons, I've gotten into watching baseball and basketball and eh, maybe a little football, but okay that's not me and i can't have a conversation i mean i i can't tell you who played in the super bowl i i knew on the day of it but yeah and forget about me knowing any of the players which okay. takes me out of an awful lot of conversation with men yeah yeah and a, a real lot and, and and it got me wondering i mean in some ways men that's what they talk about i mean you had you were on another show recently with a woman and there was a conversation about how uh, her kid went somewhere and what, what did they talk about? And he didn't remember and your guess was sports that those two guys spoke about. Uh, I lost you for a second there, Rob. Can you say a bit more about that context of the, the woman and the, yeah, the conversation? You were, you were you, there was a conversation about how her kid, her older kid, had gone, met with somebody and spent time there. And what did you talk about? He goes, I don't remember. And you guessed probably sports. I see, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. And 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 so that, but even before I, I cause I'll, I'll review uh, interviews in prepping for my interviews. Even before I had done that, I had thought if, after, right after I had read some of the book about how in some ways sports in, in a way, keeps men from having the more diverse ways of thinking because that's what they interact on and yeah. I, I guess you know and it's usually stats and who's better you know mm -hmm. yeah I, I think you're right it is a limiting thing for sure and here's another place where i'm hopeful about the future uh because my own son is not into sports or he's not into the the, the, the spectator sports as you put it there's the whole rise of what people call the board sports, uh, surfing, skateboarding, snowboarding. They're not typically competitive. They're about uh, tricks and, and can you, you know, get better at something? It's about in progress. Um, and my son is a big mountain biker, but he, he moved away from the races part. He just likes doing it with his friends and trying to get better at certain kinds of jumps and, and uh, the, 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 the joy of, of going down a, a mountain. I, I think that there's a movement away from some of those traditional sports, especially also as we see that like they destroy your brain, <laughs> you know, especially football. Um, and so I think there is some promise there also, Rob, that we may be finding that younger men especially have more to talk about, you know, whether it's the, you know, the, the joy of, of these activities or that they're, you know, even talking more emotionally, you know, that's what my, I think that there's a lot of promise in the social emotional learning that's going on in schools that gives boys more of a permission to talk about how they're feeling, not just, you know, who's the best at soccer or, or basketball. Yeah. Another way to deal with it is to start looking at sports more from the cooperation from the team aspect of it, you know, yeah. or, or look at it from a, a sociocultural perspective point of view like like Dave Zirin he writes about sports and the politics of sports and he does a, really does mm -hmm. amazing coverage without talking about statistics yeah and he'll say yeah, yeah. about players sometimes but it's usually about how players have consciousness and how players are doing something that's 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 not sports related and and, yeah. I, and I, boy that would be a nice thing to see yeah so, and I think those athletes, the sports athletes of today, especially some of the black uh, athletes are playing that conscious role that they didn't three decades ago. You know, Michael Jordan famously said, well, Republicans buy shoes, so I'm not going to get political. But LeBron James is out there, you know, speaking his mind and talking about Black Lives Matter. And, and so are a lot of the other athletes that, you know, maybe they'll boycott a trip to the White House if they disagree with the, the policies or the principles of the 
the president. So it again, that's a positive change, I think, Rob. And look at the NFL. Look at the way they change their yeah, policy. There's Colin Kaepernick and what he, he the, what he un, unleashed basically. Yeah, but it's also the I forget the name of the guy who runs the NFL, but he Roger changed, Goodall. I think, yeah, Roger Goodall. Like. He changed the yeah he changed policies major and and. So, I mean, there's a lot of hope. And, and, I, and I guess what I'm getting at is just like it happens in the Game of Thrones and Avengers, we, we've got to look at every aspect of our culture. Now, in my book, I talk about you need to look at every aspect from a top down and bottom up perspective and try to make it more bottom up. But damn, it's the same thing here, really. It's, it's really how do you find places where there can be more empathy and compassion and caring and, and courage? I mean, and, Talk about courage. I mean, you've got you've got the, the the seas. So talk about the seas now. Okay, yeah. Thanks for that invitation. Um, but wait, we think let's, that let's do another show break for a show ID, and then we'll come back and talk about the seas. Sounds good. Gonna try those. Try to find those five seas or find those values of Steve Kerr. Meanwhile, but um, yeah, ready to talk about the seas whenever you're ready. And my guest for the show is Ed Frauenheim. He's the former senior director of content at Great Place to Work, the research organization behind the Fortune 100 Best Companies to Work For list. He's co-author of the book, Reinventing Masculinity, The Liberating Power of Compassion and Connection. And he's doing workshops on more successful, inclusive masculinity at work. The, the website is reinventingmasculinity.com. So tell us about the C's. What are the C's? This, the five C's that we believe help uh, men advance from this confined masculinity to a liberating masculinity are uh, curiosity, courage, compassion, connection, and commitment, Rob. Um, and, and to say a bit more about each, these are old. Yeah, man, okay. Okay. Go. Go. Okay, the five C's that we believe help men move from a confined masculinity to a liberating masculinity are curiosity, courage, compassion, connection, and commitment. And these are old terms, but we think there's a way to look, to, look at them in new ways uh, so that really men can move, move forward, Rob. So curiosity is, is something that all people have. You know, kids are always asked, why is the sky blue? Why is why is the airplane flying, not falling out of the sky? But for so many men, it gets drilled out of us uh, by the time we're, uh, you know, young men and we're, we, we get the message that you got to be the smartest guy in the room, which means you're not allowed to be uh, acknowledging you don't know something. So we're really saying you need to come back to asking questions and especially about whether this is the only way to be a man and what are some of the ways maybe we've been limited in our lives or, or you know, not being the kind of men we'd like to be uh, up, up to now. The courage piece has to do with uh, going into some new territories with courage. So, so men are courage, courageous, uh, you know, conventionally in some really honorable ways. We'll, we'll risk our life and limb to save someone in a burning building. We'll, we'll take a financial risk in business, but we don't necessarily go into the realm of the emotions where we might have to face difficult feelings like shame or sadness or fear. And also it takes courage to acknowledge our privilege and the advantages we've had systematically as men, often if we're white, as white men. So this is the, what the courage piece means. Compassion, as we've talked before about it, Rob, is, is really not just being compassionate in some of our actions as a caring father, say, or a spouse, but embracing it and explicitly talking about how we can care for others. Uh, and, and also caring for ourselves, noticing when we're suffering and, and taking action to stop it. Men are really bad at, at taking care of themselves and even to the extent of not going to the doctor enough. Um, so that's the compassion piece. Its cousin is connection, which you've, you've written about elo eloquently. This is about seeing ourselves as connected and tied to all people all, and all, on all of life and all of the universe uh, in a fundamental way, not just in this tribal way where we had, we're in opposition to some other group, but really to see those bonds and then nurture them. Every, going everywhere from the, the, the spousal bond with our wives or our, or our partners, to our bonds with our kids, to our friendships, uh, to that sense of, of environmental stewardship. And then lastly, the commitment one is, is, is a 
pledge to stick with it, to, you know, to do practice those other four C's, even when the going gets tough. Uh, and, and there's good science now for how to do that using tools um, like mindfulness applications that can help us build self-awareness and, and emotional um, sort of self-regulation, you could say. So we're not just going from zero to 60 in our anger, but rather aware of some of the triggers we have. Uh, and also we can turn to role models. There's some really great men that are showing how to, to live a, a liberating masculinity. And we talked about some of them already, like Chuck Robbins of Cisco or Steph Curry, or the, even the Game of Thrones characters. There's, there's a lot of, of hopeful men out there that can help us on that journey to, to stay committed. Okay. So I wanted to talk to you more about the uh, way people were before civilization. You know, we've got this world that we have now and whether you're looking at Asia or whether you're looking at European culture, they're all incredibly con constricted masculinity. Mm -hmm. And the, we've been, and, but it wasn't that way always before. Yeah. So what about indigenous people? Have you looked at indigenous existing indigenous, indigenous cultures? Not uh, deep, not in a, a deep systematic way, Rob. Uh, what what we have done is, is look at um, that hit that long history of folks in in forager uh, societies, which some of the indigenous communities today would still fall under. That is to say, folks that were in in hunter gatherer type communities, and and what was striking to me in from both um, Paul Gilbert, who wrote our introduction or our forward rather, is a compassion scholar as well as the book we were just talking about, this book, Civilized to Death, about forager communities and how there was a lot of good things happening there. These societies tended to be egalitarian. They tended to be very much about the autonomy of every member. And they were very much uh, in a place of gratitude. So that, and the men showed up that way. These men tended to be sharing, uh, you know, they, they, they got their social status, not by dominating others, but by sharing what they got and, and cooperating. They also, men were, loathe to boss other people around. And these societies had all these subtle ways of, of making it clear, if you start to try to dominate other people, you'll be ostracized or possibly killed if you go too far. Uh, and then in terms of the gratitude piece, like we 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 so often operate from a place of scarcity in, in modern society that we don't even notice. But these forager societies tended to have a sense, there's enough, let's not, you know, we. There's enough nuts and, and we can't necessarily go back to that era where there was plenty plentiful food and game, but there's a sense that life is is good and we can trust how the universe is unfolding. And we in, in we are kind of kept in our places in some ways by these messages of fear. If you remember Donald Trump said, the world is a scary place. And if, if we're constantly being told to be afraid, then we are maybe more likely to gravitate toward a strong man who can protect us. But that wasn't always the case, as you put it, Rob. Yeah, I think, and, and, and often men were not in charge. Women were. Mm -hmm. or there, it's a partnership. There, it was a partnership. That's, a, that's what Rianne Eisler talks a lot about, a partnership society. Mm -hmm. And she won't say matriarchal instead of patriarchal because when women were leaders, they weren't like dominating men. Mm -hmm. Does she talk about Crete? I think I've read yes. some of her work yeah. on, on that as an interesting society. Crete. Yeah, because a lot of the, uh, the, the archaeological re research comes from pottery that is mm -hmm. interesting that shows pictures of how people related. Yeah. So what about kids? I mean, where does this start? And how do we get kids to change? And how are we doing with that? How are, I mean, you talk in the book a bit about younger people, but what about children? I wonder about even what the, the pandemic has done and yeah. living at home and how that has changed things, if it all, or has it accentuated stuff? Or, but let's, kids, and then we'll get into the pandemic. Yeah, I think that... Uh... There is a there is promise there as well. I I think the pandemic's been really hard for a lot of for a lot of kids. But I if we leave that aside for a moment and go back to where things were headed, uh, when I I was I appeared on a podcast with some a uh, couple of women who have a, a really neat podcast called On Boys, uh, on raising boys basically, and there's a lot of attention to 
to, to not just accepting that idea that boys will be boys, which is to say kind of uh, enabling bullies essentially, but rather parents and teachers and kids themselves saying, no, we're gonna like talk things out. It's ridiculous that the strongest kid is gonna, or the meanest kid is gonna dominate the playground. Uh, and I saw that with my own kids, that uh, the elementary school they went to in San Francisco had conflict resolution uh, systems so that there was, if any kids try to, you know, bully another one, they're going to have to talk it out for a long time. You know, uh, they weren't going to get necessarily punished, but it was about like, you're going to have to explain yourself and walk through what you're doing and the implications of that and hear uh, how that affected other kids. And this socio-emotional learning is, is taking off around the country such that kids are learning to not stifle their emotions if, if, if they're boys or, or girls for that matter. And also to say, we, we can figure out how to work together in ways that are not that domination oriented way. So that, all that I think is to the to the good, Rob. And I see my own kids uh, being much more able to kind of manage emotional territory and, and have relationship. My son has relationships with other boys that are quite rich in terms of emotional expressivity and talking about girlfriend relationship challenges in his case. So. I, I'm pretty hopeful there. Good, good. And what about the pandemic? How has the pandemic, if at all, affected things for better or worse? I think there's a lot of, of, of negative impact in the sense that the kids have been so isolated. Uh, we, we know we needed, we're, we're primates, right? We need to, we love that sense of touch and connecting and being together physically. You know, um, for my son, he's ton of, done a ton of video game playing. Uh, and that's, you know, that boys can get drawn into that. There's a flip side though. He's usually playing with friends, you know, and they're, they're communicating the whole time. They're cooperating, uh, you know, talking things through. So there is, I think it's a mixed bag on that front. Um, I hope I that, if, go if, ahead. If they're playing a shooter game. Yeah. yeah, no, it's that they often are. And that's not, I'm, I'm not totally comfortable with that. Um, some of the time they're doing games that are more like my, my son plays a lot of, of a game where it's just mountain biking and you're doing jumps and tricks and so forth. It's not really about beating anybody. It's like what you I mean, you might be seeking a score, uh, but again, it's that non, there's some non-competitive stuff that they're doing. Um, so I, I think there's a lot to be learned about what's going on, but I do think the attention overall to mental health, uh, to stress, to depression, you know, that's societal wide, including in the workplace. There's a lot of attention to that on the part of business leaders that you never would have seen just even two years ago. Um, but it's going throughout all of society to worry, concern about kids as well. So I think that that's probably going to be a, a positive thing. You know, I have on my notes here to ask the question, how do adult men shift? And then how do, how do the women in their lives deal with them shifting? But and, and, and then the question, a question about demographics, but our conversation about religion, really, I think that that was helpful because you know, I think a lot of people are stuck there because that's what their religion says. And they're, if they violate that, they're vi literally violating the what they think are the teachings of their religion, more like the preachings of their mega church uh, person or whatever. Yeah. But how yeah. do men, how do adult men shift what are you know i get into the seas but how what are, like what are some yeah. first steps that the guys take now yeah. your, your co-author is a therapist and he also runs men's groups so what yeah. are the first kinds of steps that men take as they're learning how to shift from this constricted to this liberated form of masculinity one of the first things that we've talked about is is reaching out to other men you know, try to develop a friendship or rekindle a friendship. Uh, th that's one of the first things that men often are, are unwilling to do or, or have a hard time with. Um, and, and one thing that I realized is it's so powerful to reach back to childhood friends often that you were really close with, that, that often those relationships often disintegrate over time or deteriorate. But those young friendships can really be a powerful source of, of comfort and meaning in life. And I would say another step is to just listen to how you're feeling, you know, be a little bit like maybe with a journal um, or, or, or a, with a kind of meditative practice, just pay more attention to how you are uh, experiencing life. And if we can develop more of a vocabulary and awareness of, of what we're going through, we might find that maybe we're not so happy 
or maybe we could be happy or maybe we are happy and we haven't been able to express it, which can make that happiness and that joy even larger. So I would say those two steps are, are connecting with others and, and connecting with ourselves, really. And another major challenge is you're asking somebody to redefine who they are as men. So how do they deal with the fear of becoming feminine when it's, I mean, and, and, and shift so that they can see that the, the liberated masculinity is, is not at all feminine or, well, you know, in a way, in an archetypal way, it is feminine. Yeah. But it doesn't mean you have to lose the, the masculine uh, elements that you may take pride in. Uh, I think that's where the role models come in. Role models like uh, like a, a Steve Kerr, coach of the Warriors, or Joe Biden. You know, if you don't want to make it political, then maybe um, you know John Snow of of uh, Game of Thrones, um, or Justin Baldoni. Of uh, you know the, these these are figures out there, or Chuck Robbins of Cisco. There's a lot of guys that are showing the way here uh, to to embrace their masculine, you know, decisiveness, the assertiveness, the the um, analytical skills, you might say at times, uh, and these more feminine soft skills, they're integrating them to one whole human being. That's how I think we can frame it in a way that doesn't threaten guys so much. It's like, you can have more. Your life can be richer and bigger. Uh, and that's really what, what liberating masculinity offers. And what about women? How do women get their men to do this? Good question. Uh, they could go on a... a, a the uh, what is it the the Greek play where the woman withheld sex until it to the men stopped the war? I mean, it doesn't have to be that extreme, maybe. Uh, but um, I think they can invite them to at, discuss some of these questions. Are you feeling? Are you happy? Well, how are you feeling? Are, do you feel like your your life is as full as you'd like it to be? They can invite them to, to uh, read books like our book, um, or to you know to see some a TED talk like by Justin Baldoni. Um, there's a you know. A lot of options for inviting inviting men into conversations with us and just listening to them, you know, and and to make space for them to share what they're what they're going through. A lot of men don't necessarily get invited to share what their what their experience is. All so right. I think that's the first step. And we've got to wrap. Any final words, uh, Rob? Thank you so much for inviting me here. I really I'm hopeful about this bottom up you know, revolution you talk about. And, and I think that the liberating masculinity is really of a piece of that where Absolutely. we can have a fuller, you know, better life as, as men and as all human beings. Okay, thank you so much. And my guest for the show has been Ed Frauenheim, who is the co-author of the book, Reinventing Masculinity, The Liberating Power of Compassion and Connection. Reinventingmasculinity.com is the website. Thank you. Thanks, Rob.